Sarah Henderson, uh, Katie Allen, thank you both very much for joining us. I, I just want to explain at the outset that the Prime Minister and the Minister for Women were unavailable to join us this morning, so I thought it would be a good idea to hear from two women in the Liberal Party about uh, what the last five or six weeks has been like for you and what needs to change as well. I guess from the outset, though, I'd be interested to hear um, how you feel about speaking on these issues. Do you feel you need to toe the line to protect your career prospects, or have we reached a point where you can speak freely. Katie Allen? Oh, nothing further from the truth. It's about speaking out. I'm mm. a voice to government. I'm a backbencher. I'm an elected representative for Higgins. And I always said I haven't gone in to be meek. So this is why I'm here. Good. Facing the lion's den. <laughs> because, I mean, this, this has been a bit of a theme in the, in the debate over recent weeks. We had uh, Catherine Cusack, a Liberal MP in New South Wales, uh, say the federal women MPs are furious and embarrassed but are not speaking out due to party loyalty. I is that right? Well, no, and I think that's why Katie and I are here and that's why we have been speaking out, David, and good morning. It's a great opportunity to talk about some of these issues in a very honest way. And I think um, for all women in the Liberal Party, we are pretty angry. But I, I do want to make the point there are many men in our party who are also disgusted and very angry about what has happened. And so now is the opportunity, it is an historic opportunity, to get this right and to address the things that are not right for women, not just in Parliament House, but across the country. And I want to come to that. You've both had uh, careers, lives outside politics, outside Parliament. So I guess I'm interested in finding out whether you're unsurprised by what we've been hearing over the last six weeks or, or whether you have genuinely been shocked. Sarah Henderson? Well, that's a risky question to ask me because I had nine years at the ABC. It was over <laughs> 20 years ago and I did have some pretty unpleasant moments, uh, particularly when I was hosting the 7.30 report, David, and, and I did address those and action was taken. But I have to say, I'm absolutely shell-shocked and disgusted by the allegations uh, which have emerged, starting, of course, with the terrible story involving the alleged rape um, of Brittany Higgins and the fact that she didn't get the support that she needed. Uh, I can't obviously talk about all of the factual matters. And then some of the incidents that have emerged this week, it's absolutely disgusting. And even now, uh, Lydia Thorpe, a Greens Victorian Senator, has given a speech in the Parliament raising concerns about a, a, a coalition, government a, a government um, person. Um, member of Parliament or Senator, uh, and I hope those allegations are properly investigated. We are very angry and we are not going to put up with this. Are they being properly investigated? Well, I hope they will be. She's raised them in the Parliament and I trust they will be. Have you spoken to her? I've spoken to her quite a bit of late, uh, reaching out to Liddy, but not about this, no. What about you, Katie Allen? Have you been shocked or is this pretty normal across the workforce? Look, I haven't had any of those sorts of experiences, so I am shocked. I'm pretty new to Parliament. Uh, but what shocks me about Parliament is the underlying lack of professionalism. I'd like to see a real change, and I think the, uh, the Prime Minister, I've been speaking to him about this, I'm very glad to hear that he's now announcing this. Um, you know, I'm a woman, I've had exposure to all sorts of sex, sexual harassment problems throughout my life, as I think any woman in Australia would say. Um, in fact, when I first came to Parliament, I was kind of shocked it wasn't worse, because I'd heard all these rumours and innuendos and stories and I've only had a really positive experience. What shocks me is I haven't seen it for myself, so what am I missing out on, really? I mean, it is really problematic with regards to the culture there, and because I haven't seen it doesn't mean it's not happening. Clearly, what's happening in the last six weeks is pretty mm. shocking for someone like me. And do you both accept there does appear at least to be a particular problem on your side of politics right now? And we can go through the list, whether it's you know, the, the Liberal staffer, Brittany Higgins, allegedly being raped by another Liberal staffer. Um, you know, the accusation against Liberal Minister Christian Porter, which he, he denies. But uh, the, the, the allegations of lewd behaviour by Liberal staffers. You've got a, one of your colleagues, Andrew Lamming, a Liberal MP, and we'll come to him shortly. But is, is there a particular problem in the Liberal Party? No, I think this is above politics, David. I think we've seen allegations across the political divide and it is deeply concerning. But um, led by the Prime Minister, I mean, I think he's up for the challenge. Uh, he led us through the pandemic and I think that um, Scott Morrison is up for the challenge of fixing this. We know this needs to be fixed. Uh, as I say, not just in our own workplace, but across the country. Mm. And uh, we, really are determined, we are determined to get this right. I don't think anyone questions that this is happening right across Parliament. I don't think 
there would be you'd be mad to think that. I mean, basically, we know this is happening right across the Australian, you know, society. And in fact, the Prime Minister last week, I think, spoke very strongly about it's not just about sexual violence, sexual harassment. It goes right back up the line. This is a whole pipeline of anger that women are feeling very frustrated about, and it's not okay. And the, yeah. and the Prime Minister did articulate that extremely well. I think he spoke to women about this pent up, you know, frustration and rage and about I'll, how unfair things can I'll be. I'll come back to the PM, but I mean, I, I, just, I do need to pull you up on this idea that yes, absolutely it exists across society and no one's suggesting there aren't problems in other parties. But boy, when you look at what's happened in the last six weeks, the overwhelming focus has been in the Liberal Party. Are, are you seriously saying I mean, you know, the, 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 the staff is masturbating on a female MP's desk at an well, alleged rape. Are you really is, saying this isn't a particular problem in your party? Uh, David, what we have heard in, in the last week, it's absolutely disgusting. Mm. I, I cannot believe that there are people possibly involved in those incidents which are still in the building. I say get out. We need the bad eggs out of our parliament, out of our party, and there should and must be a zero tolerance for this type of behaviour. Why is it happening? Why is there th these issues well, in the Liberal Party? Look, I, I really don't know because my experience, like Katie's, has been very positive. In fact, I came into Parliament with a great deal of support by Liberal men, perhaps even more so than Liberal, some Liberal women. And so my experience has been generally a uh, fairly positive. I have had, you know, my times, of course, when we've had difficult moments. And I agree with Karen Andrews. There is definitely an issue with social exclusion. You've experienced that as well? Yeah, I have. And I have raised that. Um, that does worry me. Just explain that to us. How does that manifest for you? Well, it just manifests in, I think many of the women are spending far too many, and I think this is across the, the divide, but this is my experience. We are spending far too much time in our offices alone and not engaging with our colleagues where a lot of the discussions happen informally about things that we can do better, about policy, about ideas, about working together on certain things. Uh, let me just say, well, though, the, that... The blokes will catch up for a drink and have those discussions, but you're not invited or you don't feel like it's, you can be It doesn't that. happen all the time, but it does happen and I understand why Karen Andrews hmm. um, has said that, that she that has had a gutful. Uh, look, I don't like to disagree with Sarah, but the class of 2019 is complete fresh of breath, you know, breath of fresh air. Um, we have uh, functions together regularly. Um, there are some fantastic women in the class of 2019 and Sarah is um, an extra woman because That's she right. came in a little bit later, but um, we've got people like Celia Hammond, Angie Bell, Fiona Martin, Bridget Archer, Holly Hughes. They've been amazing and I have had an amazing class of 2019 experience. We have regular get-togethers to get virtually every day and feel very inclusive. And in fact, we caught up last Thursday, men and women. And I actually said to this group of people, I said, we are the vanguard of change. We are what we want to see. These men have been incredibly supportive of us as women and vice versa. And that's what you want to see. That's what you want to see is you want to feel women don't feel special or different. Women are part of the decision making and that's what we want in our government. You've both said things need to change. What needs to change? What do you want to see? Katie Allen? Well, if you look at the Respect at Work um, report, which I've been ploughing my way through, it's an incredible document. It talks about where culture, you know, workplaces that are really not doing so well. It actually names um, media and communications as one of them, mm -hmm. uh, construction, and it actually talks about medicine and the law, which surprised me because I come from medicine. It didn't mention Parliament, and that's what's really good is that Kate Jenkins, the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, is now going to do a bespoke inquiry into Parliament. That is well needed. But what we look at that report, you see, they say three factors that are very important for a toxic environment for women. One, strong hierarchies. Um, and of course, parliament is a hierarchy by its very nature. The second thing is lack of awareness. And we need to get mandatory inductions for staff and MPs and mandatory OHS on an annual basis to make sure people are aware. And then the so third in, thing, sorry, just just the yeah, sorry, third thing yeah. uh, is alcohol in the workplace. What do you want to happen with alcohol in the workplace? Well, um, Patricia Gavillis knows that I 
did sort of say it's something worth thinking about um, is that we need to have at least responsible drinking. Um, but, you know, there are people, even ministers have said to me, you know what, Katie, I think a dry environment might not be a bad thing for Parliament. Uh, so the other thing is to... reducing hours that you sit. So it used to be in the House of Reps you would sit all night. It's been reduced to you stop at 8pm. It could come back to 7 or even 6, which means that people could go home and have a bit more of a normal lifestyle. It's a pretty long day. I start at 6am in the morning. I'm often not home till 10 and 11 o'clock. I live with some ministers. I can tell you they're home after me and they leave before me. What about you? What sort of change, Senator, would you like to see? Look, I agree with Katie. I think alcohol is a problem. I also think very sadly, and Janet Albertson made this point in a column she wrote recently, um, MPs and senators are not that special. I mean, we are here to serve the community. And I've heard a few rumours about drugs. Um, perhaps we need to start to look at that issue as well. MPs using I, drugs? I, I haven't heard anyone in particular, but I'm just hearing a bit of scuttlebutt. And we need to be the best possible workplace. Does so, that mean what, uh, drug testing or breath testing for well, alcohol? Or I, I think we need... Yeah, you'd be perhaps, up for that? Yeah, and you'd be I up would for be that. too. Breath Absolutely. testing MPs? Yep. Drug testing MPs. Yes, I think we absolutely. need to have the highest possible standards in our workplace. I mean, I, I, I have heard of people talking about how they drink, you know, and you know, because it helps them to stay up at night. I'm like, I sat in an emergency department as a young doctor mm. uh, through the hours, trying to stay awake. You know, having a drink isn't what you do. You know, we're making important All decisions right. on behalf of the other thing that yeah, I think sorry. we've got some outdated procedures and policies, and I really mm -hmm. welcome the very um, strong decision that Kate Jenkins is going to be running this inquiry into our own workplace and into all Commonwealth workplaces. Things like uh, if there is a problem with a particular staffer and the MP has a view that that staffer is not an issue, then the Department of Finance should be able to step in and terminate that staffer. Does so, Frank Zumbo come to mind here, Craig Yes, Kelly he staffer? does. You he think does. the Finance Department should be able to dismiss I, him without yeah, Craig Kelly say so? Because the Commonwealth is the employer. Absolutely. We are not the employer. We are the delegate. And if there are serious allegations against a staff member, then the Department of Finance should be able to step in and terminate that staff member if there are proper grounds to do so. And there should be training for MPs about how to um, support staff. I mean, I regularly do performance reviews. I do um, listening each week. We sit down and debrief because our staff my staff as a House of Reps member are exposed to 110,000 people who have some pretty serious things going on in their life. Every and, day. you know, yeah. every day. And they are counselling, supporting, caring for these people. They need that support and they're not getting it. We need to make sure we provide a supportive workforce that is in a professional environment so that people can get on and do what they need to do for the taxpayer. What about quotas in the Liberal Party? Well, I'm very lukewarm about quotas and I think I can point to 2019 where 50-50 men and women came into the House of Reps. We had a great number of um, eight, I think eight females and eight males and then almost gender equity into the Senate. But you're still but stuck at 23% women right. in Parliament. Labor's had quotas, they're now at 47%. And that For is 25 not, years. And that's not... That's not good enough, but let me just make this point, David. Mm. A quotas does not cut out the bad behaviour. Uh, no, that is I, don't, not, I don't think anyone's saying it would. And, and, of course, we can point to the Labor Party, which has quotas, as an example. So we need to do much more than that. Certainly, I think there is any, an issue with Liberal women. Not enough Liberal women are in safe seats. Mm. That is a problem because that stops them rising through uh, to the leadership groups and into sure. cabinet. But can you really say at the moment, I mean, you, you effectively have quotas for the ministry on the number of national party MPs, the number of senators and reps, the who comes from which state and the party. factions and all of that. Can you really say that the, the current ministry is there on, on talent alone? We as a party need to look at how we... Um, manage and support people to get where we want them to mm. get. Now we've got a new candidate training program. Uh, we've just finished the second round of that here in Victoria. We had 60 people through the system. In this last intake of 26, 11 were women. But importantly, 11 were also multicultural because we need more than just women diversity. We need the, the diversity that reflects society. Okay. Now, the thing about this candidate training is I actually think we should have quotas for that. Um, if you look at the issue of quotas, there's lots of different ways to do quotas. In the Labor Party, they add a 10% loading to the women. I understand okay. that's what they do. Now, I would like to see, not then it can't just be a tick the box. There has to be enabling and support. I went through a Women's to Win committee. Uh, we've now got these uh, candidate uh, programs going, so which provides that, that support. Okay. And quotas at that level would yeah. be very 
I've, been, I've been involved in that program and it's an oh, ex-growth okay. program. Let, can I just make one quick just point briefly, also? Yeah. Yep. It's not just about getting women into parliament, it's about keeping them. Mm -hmm. And that's why things have dramatically got to change. And if you look what Nicole Flint th went through, absolutely, uh, that was absolutely disgraceful what she endured. And we have lost a great woman and a great Liberal MP, and so it is you about change. That, absolutely. absolutely. Okay, have Particularly to on the hustings. Okay. It is we terrible. have to as change the behaviour, and I endured a lot of it too, yep. David, as a, no, no, no. as a marginal seat member. It is absolutely... A couple of quick ones. Does the Prime Minister have any women in his office you would consider to be part of his inner circle? Absolutely. Who's that? Well, there's a number of women. Um, I actually spent... I won't name names because I don't know that that's okay, appropriate. But it's not an all male in a circle. There's a national not security advisor, an economics advisor, yeah. women's there's, advisor, there's women there's everywhere. bench liaison right. officers. I spent an hour spent with actually time. one of um, the Prime Minister's senior women okay. uh, talking through a number of these issues so in you my office that just idea, during the week. You're just surrounded by a bloke. What about Andrew Lamming, your colleague? Are you happy with him staying in your party room? I think Andrew has uh, been in Parliament now for 17 years, since 2004. I think he has uh, obviously been, um, what he's been doing is completely outrageous. And um, I'm very pleased that he's going to take some time off. Clearly, the stress must be getting to him. Uh, he's got a young family. Um, he needs counselling. Um, I suspect he needs, or he's getting clinical counselling as well. And I really think he needs to have a pretty serious look about whether he's going to recontest the next general election. Well, David, I agree. Um, there is no excuse for bad behaviour. I'm really appalled by Andrew's conduct. Um, it's our job to call this out, no matter what side of politics. And he has indicated that he is reconsidering his future and that's appropriate. Should the Prime Minister boot him out of the Liberal Party? Well, I think perhaps Andrew has taken that into his own hands. He's taken leave. He's obviously recognised he needs help. Uh, he's indicated that he's reconsidering his future and so I expect we'll hear more news very soon. But let's call a spade a spade. If you had a big majority, he'd be gone, wouldn't he? Well, we don't know. I mean, um, I mean, I obviously can't speak for the Prime Minister, uh, but we can certainly say, as Liberal women, this is not good enough. You, are, and you we won't accept are you comfortable with him being in your party room? I'm not comfortable with the conduct and I, I hope that Andrew makes the right decision. Because you hope he goes? I do. And, and you hope he goes? I think 17 years is a long time to be in Parliament and I think he might like, like to reconsider his future. Katie Allen and Sarah Henderson, thank you both very much for joining us this morning. Thank, thank you. you.